When reflecting on the events of this night, to share this story with you, I realize how truly lucky I am. This event took place a few years ago when I was taking my family on a road trip for spring break. I'm a father of two beautiful girls and married to an amazing wife. At the time of the story, my daughters were ages 6 and 8. My wife and I decided it would be best to just drive throughout the night rather than stay somewhere for the first night of driving. In the middle of the night, I was starting to get a bit tired, so I decided to stop at the rest stop and grab some coffee and use the restroom. I figured the fresh air and stretching of the legs would be just what I needed to proceed onward. When we got to the rest stop, there was almost nobody there, which I guess wouldn't be super uncommon for the middle of the night. There was, however, an extremely old woman sitting at the counter of this 24-hour market, as well as a black car on the far side of the parking lot. I told my wife to remain in the car with the sleeping girls, and I would be right back. I walked inside and greeted the older woman with a hello, and she still continued to keep her back to me and ignore me. Weird, but I honestly didn't care. I was in the bathroom for several minutes. After I went to the bathroom, I washed my face and tried to wake myself up a little bit. When I walked out of the bathroom, my real nightmare began. There were two men holding up the convenience store. One of them was dressed in all black and holding some kind of blunt object, and the other was wearing a t-shirt and was covered in tattoos and what looked like blood all over the aforementioned t-shirt. He was waving a knife around, gesturing and posturing towards this poor old woman behind the counter. I didn't know what to do. This woman was in danger, but my family was outside, and I didn't want to bring any unneeded danger to them. Actually, I didn't know if they already were in danger and could be in need of help outside. Luckily, my cell phone was on me. I went into the bathroom and quietly called the authorities. The lady on the phone told me to stay on the line, and just before I could respond to her, the bathroom door busted open. I jumped up on the toilet seat and turned the call volume all the way down on my phone. I looked through the crack on the stall door and there was the guy covered in blood. I was holding my breath, hoping he wouldn't come into the stall. I also began fearing for my family because the other man could have went outside and noticed my family in our van. The man in the bathroom began to wash his hands and kept uttering the same line, We got this, we got this, we got this. My instincts were telling me to jump out and attack, but my brain was telling me to just wait. This man had a knife, and if I tried attacking him, it may not end up well for me, and how could I protect my family if I was injured? After about a minute, he left the bathroom. I forgot that I was still in the line with 911, and I put my phone back in my pocket. I slowly crept out of the bathroom and didn't see the old woman at the register. All I saw was the two men behind the counter stuffing what looked like cash in a bag. I saw sirens coming through the lot and that's when I decided to book it out the door and back to my family. As I ran out the door, one of the men lunged at me with a knife, missing ever so slightly, causing me to fall to the ground. At this point, the cops were already running into the store. One of the men immediately fell to the floor and threw down his weapon, but the man covered in blood tried to run out the back. The cops were able to get him quickly and apprehend him without incident. Both men were arrested and placed in the back of patrol cars. The elderly employee was okay and apparently only suffered minor injuries. The reason why I didn't see her was because one of the guys had knocked her over the head with a blunt object and she had fallen to the ground. I got back to my car and thankfully my family was alright as well. My wife thought I was taking a while and was wondering why I wasn't answering my phone, but couldn't leave the car with the kids inside alone. Also, from her vantage point, she couldn't see what was going on inside the store. As I was giving my statement to the police, I found out that when I walked in, the employee behind the counter wasn't ignoring me. She was watching the live camera feeds of the outside of the store where the guys were pacing back and forth. I'm very grateful that myself nor my family weren't harmed during this terrifying event. We were able to continue on with our trip without any other issues, but... Understandably, I was shaken up for a while and certainly didn't have a clear mind for our trip. You never in a million years think something like this can happen to you. Looking back on it, it almost feels like a dream or more of a nightmare. Anyway, 
I hope none of you are reading this have to experience something this unsettling in your lifetimes. Beaches often come to mind when you think about spring break. That's probably because most people need a break from their stressful job or schoolwork and want to get away. And what better place to unwind than on the beach with warm sand, cool breezes, and refreshing water? The scenario in my story was unfortunately not the relaxing getaway that I had hoped for. A couple of years ago, my boyfriend and I took a trip way down south to enjoy some much-needed relaxation. We both were extremely stressed with work and really needed a mental break from everything at the office. To be fair, most of the trip was pretty relaxing until a night where my boyfriend and I were laying on the beach, which was weird for us. We never really went to the beach at night as we both preferred the warm sunlight during the day. We were watching the moon reflect off the water when we saw two people walk up to us seemingly out of nowhere. I noticed that one of them was a girl, quite pretty actually. She had wild, curvy hair and from what I could see of her eyes, they looked very dark. She was wearing a beach cover-up over her bathing suit and she was with a guy. I assume her significant other because she was holding his hand. He had a huge beard with long brown hair that was in a bun. He was wearing a red flannel that was unbuttoned with no shirt underneath and just plain bathing suit shorts. They just stood there, standing over us, way too close, making us uncomfortable. Both of them just staring and smiling at us, honestly smiling for no reason. Finally, my boyfriend, a little annoyed, said, Excuse me, uh, can we help you with something? The woman, still smiling, said in a slow, soft voice, You two are quite beautiful, you know. I was at a loss for words and just looked over to my boyfriend and he just said, Uh, thanks. Can you leave us alone now? Clearly, his annoyance was turning into anger. The woman looked at him and said in a chipper, creepy voice, No thank you. Well, she still continued to smile. Her boyfriend still continued to just stand there, stiff and not moving. After a moment, another couple came over. Again, both were smiling. She also had a cover-up on, but was sporting some pigtails that were not even close to symmetrical and her boyfriend had a really curly, shaggy-looking hair. The woman standing basically on top of us adverted her attention to them and said, Look, a new couple. I was pretty unsettled, and these four people just kept inching closer and closer to me and my boyfriend. My boyfriend finally stood up and stepped to one of the guys and said, Yo, take one more step, man, and... All four of the smiling weirdos began laughing and before I could even react, one of the guys lunged on my boyfriend. It was the scariest thing that I had ever seen. Both men started to beat up my boyfriend while both girls just sat there and laughed. I tried to intervene, but one of the girls tossed me to the ground. The two guys then threw my boyfriend down in the sand next to me, and with a blink of an eye, their permanent smiles turned into faces of anger and malice. Somehow, my boyfriend had the mindset to do something to help us get out of there. He kicked the ankle of one of the girls, so she stumbled. This brought the attention of the others to her stumbling backwards in the sand. In this split second, he grabbed my hand and we ran as fast as we could towards our resort. Looking in the distance, we could see the two couples standing there, but they were not giving chase. We got back to our room and locked the doors and turned the lights off. All night long in the hallway, we could hear giggles and shushes. I don't know if we were just paranoid, but I think we both feared that it was the freak shows from the beach. The next day, we checked out early from the hotel and left for home. We didn't want to risk running into these dangerous strangers again. We also didn't want to call the cops and file a report and all of that. As we were leaving the hotel and walking to our car, we saw the two girls on the corner of the street waving and smiling at a car that wasn't ours. We couldn't believe it. We just peeled out and left for home, putting this experience behind us. When we got home, we decided to inform the resort of our incident, and they apologized and said they would look into the matter, but stated since no report was filed at the time of the incident, 
there was probably not much that they could do. I know some of you may not find the story particularly scary on the traditional sense, but encountering such psychotic people who would harm strangers without a second thought is by far the most traumatic experience of my life. Yeah, happy vacation. Let me preface this by saying that terrible things don't just happen in the movies, but in fact they can happen in an everyday normal life. Most people are lucky enough to go through life without any major encounters. I had an experience that I would like to share to see what people think. Was I rational in my choices? Did I overreact? What would you have done? I think hearing responses will be therapeutic and perhaps help me get past the events of this story. Last year, I attended a major university on the southeastern coast of the United States. I loved it so much, mainly because I didn't have to deal with snow or the cold weather. I basically had hot or warm weather every day, which was a huge change from the climate I grew up in. Anyways, on this particular spring break from school, I decided to go home and visit my parents back in Maine. I decided that I was going to try to drive the over 20-hour drive straight through perhaps stopping for brief naps or food along the way. At first, this seemed like an awesome idea. I could get there relatively quickly and spend most of my time at home rather than traveling. I spent most of the drive listening to music and catching up on some of my favorite podcasts. Unfortunately, the trip would take a terrible turn in Pennsylvania. I was driving through PA shortly after midnight and, well, my eyes started to get a little heavy. And... I was having a lot of trouble focusing on the road, and anybody who has driven through Pennsylvania knows that it's a hard drive even when you have complete focus. It's always foggy and very mountainous with many twists and turns. I decided that my next rest area I would pull over and at least rest my eyes for an hour or two just to be safe. Well, I never made it to the rest area. I dozed off for a second and lost control of my small car and went right off the side of the road through a guardrail and down to a small drop-off. Miraculously, I wasn't injured too badly, but my car was destroyed and I was completely surrounded by trees, not sure of how to get back up and onto the highway. Of course, it was pitch black outside and the trees consumed the entire area, blocking out most of the natural starlight. I tried to remain calm and ignored the terrible pain I was experiencing to try and call and get help. One problem, I couldn't find my phone. It was in my cup holder, but after the crash it was so dark I couldn't find it anywhere. Inside or outside of my car, no luck. I didn't think I was injured badly as previously mentioned, but I wanted to use the flashlight on my phone to make sure I didn't have any major cuts or anything. I then decided my best course of action at this point would be to see if it was possible to climb back up the slight decline that my car had fallen off of. It seemed impossible in my condition and with the limited visibility. It just wasn't a height I could reach at the moment and truth be told I was lucky that I wasn't injured further after my car dropped down. Thankfully the guardrail slowed my car down enough. Realizing that climbing, driving or calling anybody wasn't an option I began to yell and scream for help, but as you can imagine, it didn't work. I slouched to the side of my car and finally started to feel real emotion. I was scared and cold, and now the real fear finally started to make my eyes fill up with tears. I had no survival skills, what was I going to do until morning, just sit in a ball in fetal position? I decided that walking through the wooded area until I can find an area to climb where maybe there was a slight hill instead of a drop off where my car was. Of course, now in hindsight, my best bet would have probably been to just stay put because somebody in the morning would have noticed the accident and phoned it in. Maybe even someone passing by in the night and noticing the damage at the side of the road. As I grabbed some items from my car, I heard a noise. It sounded like ruffling of tree branches and footsteps. I hid on the other side of my car, paralyzed in fear. What kind of animals did they have in Pennsylvania? My first thought was a bear or something like that. Is that how it's going to end? Mauled by a bear? 
However, what actually presented itself in front of me was even more shocking. It was three men coming out from the trees. I couldn't make out too much, but all three of them had huge beards, looked like their clothes were completely dirty and were carrying hunting rifles. I wasn't sure if I should yell for help or to stay hidden from those men. For some crazy reason, my instincts were telling me to stay hidden, which seems like the exact opposite thing you would be in a situation like this. One guy, who looked like the tallest of the three, yelled out in a raspy, rugged voice, Anyone there? They didn't have any flashlights or anything, so I decided to quietly sneak around the other side of my car and make a run for it into the woods. As I slowly and very quietly made my way around the car, I was wrestling with the idea in my head that these people probably just wanted to help, and I was probably putting myself in more danger by running into the woods. But their demeanor and possibly of getting shot was a chance that I didn't want to take. I was about five feet cleared from the car when I started to sprint, and of course in no time at all I brought noise and attention to myself. The same man as before caught a glimpse of me as I ran into the woods and yelled, Hey! Hey, get back here! I swear I heard the loud boom of a gunshot. I didn't hear it hit a tree or anything, I just remembered hearing a loud boom. I don't know what else it could have been. I was terrified. I heard them following me from what seemed like several directions. I heard one of them yelling something about private property or restricted land, something of that nature. I just kept running and running for about an hour until I finally saw faint lights shining through the trees. It was a road that looked like it led to a small town or at least a few stores with lights. I walked into the gas station, feeling and looking bloody, battered and bruised. The worker inside looked baffled and disgusted. I told him to please call the police. and The police showed up in no time and my parents were notified. They were going to drive down and pick me up as soon as they could. The police insisted I go to a local hospital so my injuries could be assessed. When talking to the police, I told them everything about the three guys that came to the scene of the accident and chased me with weapons into the woods. The police said that they would locate my car and take a look to see if they could find anything or anyone. My car was empty. Everything had been stolen out of it. Even some of the interior car parts had been removed. Nothing else really came from this incident. I didn't have any major injuries and my insurance took care of the car. I now live back home with my parents and attend school locally. I try not to drive at night if I don't have to. I guess I have a phobia or something now. I am thankful to be alive and well but still have anxiety and terrible thoughts pertaining to that night. I don't know what was more damaging to my psyche, having a major accident or being chased through the woods by three random people. This story happened to me when I was 18 years old in my senior year of high school. It was spring break of 2009 and my family was taking a trip to my uncle's house in Florida. He lived in a small but really beautiful home in West Palm Beach, Florida. Any of you who are familiar to this area know that it's really nice and a lot of people go there when they are reaching retirement age. My uncle was around that age and really enjoyed the community that he was living in. For as long as I can remember, we would make this trip for spring break. It was cheap and affordable for my parents because we obviously didn't need to get a hotel and we cooked at his house every night. So the most expensive part of the trip was just getting down there, which wasn't too bad. Next door to my uncle lived a guy named Robert, who was basically part of the family. He was an older guy who always made terrible jokes, but knew they were terrible, so usually got a pretty good laugh anyway. My family and I enjoyed his company, especially when we would play cards. He was a great partner to have in most card games. Unfortunately, in 2009, when we went down to my uncle's house for our yearly trip, Robert was gone, and my uncle had a new next-door neighbor named Leo. When we arrived at my uncle's house, Leo was standing in his garage, pretty much just staring at our car. We waved, and he waved back. Only when he waved, he had 
no emotion in his face. He was pretty tall, definitely over six foot and slightly overweight. He had the build of a bodybuilder who had just gotten older and was not able to keep up with the lifting. He had dark black hair that was parted with a bit of white hair sprinkled throughout. The first few nights went great and we had fun just visiting and enjoying the beautiful Floridian weather. I think the third day, my brother and I were throwing the football around the yard and we noticed Leo just staring at us again through his front window. I mean, it was harmless, just kind of weird and creepy. He was blatantly just standing there holding the curtain back and watching us. Later that night, my brother and I just sat outside on the porch just hanging out talking about the NBA and enjoying the beautiful Florida night. All night long, we heard strange noises coming from inside Leo's house. It sounded like metal grinding, lots of coughing, and even some faint yelps. And I kid you not, when I say all night, 1, 2, even 3 a.m., all this commotion persisted. We thought it was weird, but we really didn't think anything of it. In the morning, we were eating breakfast, and there was Leo just sitting in the open garage looking back and forth between his garage and my uncle's house. How was he up so early? This guy literally must not sleep. He was up all night doing God knows what, making all sorts of noise. We asked our uncle if he knew anything about Leo next door, and he said he didn't really. Other than good morning or a polite how are you today, they really didn't say much to each other. My uncle did say that he was quiet, but always polite to him and stays out of everyone's business. He didn't attend any community meetings or activities or anything like that. We asked about the loud noises at night and my uncle said he didn't really know too much about that and have never really noticed anything before. Later that afternoon, my brother and I were throwing the football around again. Leo left his house to his teal minivan. We waved, but this time he didn't wave back. My brother and I both looked at each other and decided to go look in his windows. Now we knew that this was wrong and I would have never ever recommended doing this but our curiosity got the better of us. When we looked through some of the exposed windows we could only see a little but it was weird. There was really no furniture. There was a wood saw in the middle of one of the rooms and sheets hanging everywhere. There was also several shovels by the back door and some plywood on some of the floors in another room. Now, when Robert had lived there in the past, we had been in that house many times and it looked nothing like this. The house was completely changed and not in a good way. As we started our way back to the road, we were stopped on the side of the house by Leo. He stood blocking our way. He said in a very stoic and low voice, what are you doing on my property? Thinking quick on our feet, I just said to him very casually, Oh, sorry, our, our ball took a really awkward bounce and we couldn't find it. We got it now though, we're all good. We started to walk by him, as he barely gave us enough room to cross. As we got to the road, he shouted in a bit more of a frantic voice this time, If I catch you on my property again, you'll be sorry. My brother has a bit of a temper, so I thought he was going to confront the creepy old man. But to my surprise, he was just as freaked out as I was. What did this guy mean? We'll be sorry, I thought. The next few nights, we heard the same noises during different parts throughout the night. The last night of our trip, we decided that we were going to get to the bottom of this one way or another. At about 2am, we snuck outside and crept up to the window... We looked at the other day, and now it was completely shut up, just like all of the other windows. Couldn't see anything inside. Just as we were going to give up and go back, my brother had noticed that there was some light shining from the back. His back door window was exposed. We snuck to the window and looked inside. And what we saw inside still creeps me out to this day. We saw a bit of Leo from the doorway he appeared to be using the wood saw that we had seen, and on the ground, we saw something that looked like another human, but it was stiff and stuck in a position like a mannequin. The mannequin, or whatever it was, looked like it had blonde hair that had been glued on. As our imagination 
finally gotten the best of us. What were we witnessing? The tinkerings of a madman? Or someone preparing for something much more sinister? We left the next day and saw Leo again standing in his driveway waving goodbye to us. My brother and I felt sick about the night before. Unfortunately, we never did go back to that house. My uncle bought a new larger home about 35 miles away from his previous community. I often think back to that trip and really wonder what was going on in there. Was Leo really up to something evil or were we just two young adults letting our minds get the better of us? Maybe he was just a creeper with some type of weird fetish. Either way, I'm glad we never had to see him again. I've only shared this story one other time before and that was with my brother. I'm hoping that by getting this down and writing it may help me get past the incident or at least be therapeutic. This story starts when I was in my mid-twenties. I had started and stopped college twice already and was constantly in and out of new jobs. I didn't really have a direction in life and was kind of just going through the motions. I still lived at home with my parents. I wanted to move out but simply couldn't afford my own place yet. Our next door neighbor to the left was Zeke. This wasn't his real name but when he introduced himself to new people he always just called himself Zeke. It's important to note that Zeke was middle-aged, probably about six foot tall, with a decent build other than a slowly developing beer belly. He was slightly bald on top and had long hair about shoulder length. For the most part, he was a pretty miserable guy. Every time I saw him, he looked angry or upset about something. He was up all hours of the night and would always be wandering around his yard complaining about something. I used to tell my parents I didn't think he slept because he would be up late messing around in his backyard and would also be out in his front porch extremely early in the morning when I left for work. As far as I could tell, he rarely left the house, and when he did, he usually came back within minutes. I don't know if he was independently wealthy or what, but I'm pretty sure he didn't have a job, unless he worked from home. My parents know Zeke a little better than me. He was their neighbor when they first moved years and years ago, and always tell me that Zeke was a much different person back then. Apparently, when I was younger, too young to remember, Zeke lived in that house next door with his family. He had a wife and two daughters that I think were close to my age. My parents tell me that they would often be in the backyard having cookouts and swimming in their in-ground pool. Come to mention it, I do think I somewhat vaguely remember going over there for a cookout or two when I was a kid. Apparently, all of a sudden, things started to diminish. My family would hear fights next door that seemed to always end in the police being called. They would hear the poor children crying as Zeke would unleash his verbal violence tirades on the family, loud enough for the whole block to hear. Now, my parents have lived here for decades, and they would often say that they never heard this family fight, and they always seemed like really great people. So they were pretty shocked when all of this erratic behavior started. My parents say that one day out of the blue, Zeke's wife left with the children and never returned. As I grew up, I noticed that Zeke spent most of his time in a room adjacent from mine across the sides of our individual houses. This room that he frequented had no TV or no radio or anything other than a chair. At least that's all I could see from my point of view. He would just sit in this yellow room and seemingly stare at the yellow walls. He would drink beer sometimes too much and he would cry and sometimes he would just talk sit there and talk to himself alone in this room fast forward to the time that this story took place it was spring break and most of my friends were going down to miami beach unfortunately i was broke and had no job so i was going to have to stay home one afternoon i was sitting on my porch and zeke came over and approached me this was probably the first conversation I've had with the man in five or so years. He told me he had won some contest, and won a free three-night stay at some private ski resort in the mountains. He then asked if I would watch his cat, and just make sure that the house was okay while he was gone. He told me he would pay me for my services, so I of course accepted, knowing I could use the money. He gave me a key and 
told me the cat food was on the counter and that I couldn't miss it. He told me to come over at 6pm and to use the back door because nobody uses the front door anymore. I found it pretty weird that he didn't want to bring me into his house and show me where the food was or even introduce me to the cat or anything. He literally just gave me a key and left. But I just figured, whatever, he's weird so it kind of makes sense. At 6pm the following day I showed up at his house and walked to the back door as I was directed to do. The backyard was disgusting and not how I remembered. The pool had no water in it but was filled with half dirt and half murky liquid. The grass was either dead or super overgrown in spots. There was trash and broken lawn furniture everywhere. I walked into the house and it smelled absolutely horrible. It smelled like bad steaks. It was seriously repulsive. But I guess people can go nose blind to certain smells if you're constantly subjected to them. When you walked in through the back door, you walk into a long hallway. There were two rooms to my left and two rooms to my right. The first two on the left were the two little girls' rooms. It was haunting and a little sad because the rooms looked untouched. There were still toys on the floor and clothes folded on the dresser. One of the rooms had a board game on the ground that looked like it was in mid-game. The first room on the right was the master bedroom. There was a king-sized bed that wasn't made but didn't look like it had been used in years. There were clothes, including what I imagine were his ex-wife's clothes on the dresser, all folded. The second room on the right had the door closed but a light shining underneath the doorway. I opened the door and it was the yellow room that I could see from my bedroom. But I could barely concentrate on the room because when I opened the door, I was almost knocked out from the smell. There was also a major chill when I opened the door. It was like opening the door and walking into a cooler or something. I shut the door and made my way to the kitchen and living room that were at the end of the hall. All I can remember thinking is that my friends were down in Miami Beach enjoying spring break and I was in a disgusting and depressing house trying to make some extra cash. I found the cat dish and the cat food but hadn't seen a cat yet. I poured the food into the dish and just tried to take in my surroundings. The kitchen looked like a bomb exploded, garbage and trash everywhere. It was clear that Zeke had really given up on cleanliness, or at least pertaining to his residence. But who was I to judge? While I was looking around the kitchen, I couldn't shake this weird feeling of wanting to go back and look into the yellow room. I made my way back down the hall and actually the smell didn't really bother me anymore and I didn't notice the cold. Very strange, I thought, so I opened the door and looked inside. The room was definitely strange. There was a brown wooden chair in the middle of the room that just faced the wall. The bottom of the wall had a small vent that had some burn marks on the side of it. I can't explain why, but I just stood and stared at the vent for a few minutes. I finally broke my stare and looked all around the room. There were scratch marks on the hard wood floors. They were more prevalent over in the opposite corner of the room. My heart began to pound rapidly because I thought I could hear voices down in the basement through the vents. It was the strangest feeling that I had ever had. It was fear, but nothing like anything I had ever felt before. I started to focus on the vent again, trying to hear what these voices were saying. They sounded muffled, but they were clearly voices. Was it a radio or a TV left on in the basement? It sounded like a woman, and an elderly woman, I thought. I finally broke my trance and delusion in the yellow room and wanted to investigate the basement. I made my way to the basement door, which was off of the kitchen. There was a giant pile of trash blocking the basement door. I kicked it all to the side, attempting to get the doorknob. After some struggle, I got to the doorknob and forced the door open. Again, I was hit by a gust of cold air, even colder than previously mentioned about the house and the yellow room specifically. I could now smell the horrid smell again, and the voice or static voices seemed to be getting louder. I turned on the light and proceeded down the stairs and half-heartedly spoke out. Is anyone there? Are you okay? There was no response and... As I got further down the stairs, I realized that nobody was down there. It was empty. 
deserted, not even any garbage or storage. Nothing. The basement light was clearly dim. To be honest, there was more illumination coming from the street lights outside the basement window than there was from the light itself. With the orange glow from outside, I could see some kind of silhouette in the back of the room that I hadn't noticed before. I spoke up again in a shaking voice. Hello? Is someone back there? Are you okay? Right as I stopped speaking, the shadow or silhouette or person, whatever you want to call it, made a quick move towards me. I screamed and just ran away. Ran back up the stairs, not looking back. As I flew up the stairs, I could swear I heard a hissing noise. I made my way to the top of the stairs and was now running down the long hallway. I could again hear the muffled voices that I heard earlier as I was running by. As I got to the end of the hallway and approached the back door, I turned around to see if whatever was down there had followed me up the stairs. Again, I saw the dark figure. It was very tall and I couldn't really see a face. I turned and ran as fast as I could. I didn't even run back home, I just kept running and ran all the way to the local convenience store a few blocks away. I sat there for a few moments trying to comprehend what it was that I had seen. Had someone broken in? Did someone live in the basement? Did I experience something paranormal? I went home and hugged both my parents and told them that I didn't want to go into that house anymore and asked if I could contact Zeke to find someone else to do it. They agreed and didn't press me any further for information. I can't explain what happened in that house, and I'm not sure what I experienced or what I saw. I still feel guilty I didn't call the cops in case there truly was a home intruder. Zeke never came back to that house. He never answered his phone. I don't know if he moved or what happened. He never contacted any of us and to be honest I don't think I have ever seen anyone at that house since that night. One positive thing that came from this story is that it was the turning point in my life where I started making better decisions. I started to go back to school and I'm actually on track to graduate next year. I have a job and am saving up to get my own place once school is over. Does anyone have any insight on this matter? Any answers to this mysterious occurrence? How did I hear voices in the vent? What was causing the changes in temperature and smell and... What was it that I saw? Was it human? Or perhaps paranormal? Spring break has always been one of my favorite times of the year. As a child, I used to go on vacation to the ocean or sometimes even Disney World, and now as an adult, my wife and I go on vacations together around the same time our children are out of school for spring break. For me, there is no better place than the ocean at night. The way the moonlight glows on the waves of the water and the sound of the waves crashing always give me peace of mind. Well, this particular year, my wife and I saved up a little extra money and rented a private house right on the ocean. It was amazing. Drinking my coffee on the ocean every morning and enjoying an alcoholic beverage every night as the moon rose was truly great. One day, I passed out on the beach for a couple of hours, only to awaken with horrible nightmares. They were strange, and the only thing I remember is darkness and screaming. A lot of screaming. My wife asked if I was okay, and I said, yeah, just a little shooken up. That night, my wife went to bed fairly early, but I couldn't sleep. Not sure if it was the long nap that I had taken earlier in the day, or the horrible nightmares that woke me from said nap. Either way, I wanted to clear my head, so I decided to go for a walk on the ocean. As I kept walking on the desolate beach, I approached something that appeared to be glowing in the sand. I started to approach it quickly, but with a little bit of caution. It was some sort of glowing red ball. It's kind of hard to describe, but I'll do the best I can. It didn't look like cheap plastic. It literally was a glowing red ball of light that didn't seem to have any actual shape. I stared rather intently until it flashed so bright that it knocked me down on the sand. 
The ball flew up in the air and shot itself out into the ocean, and as it reached the horizon there was a huge blast of light. Within seconds the sky looked as if though it was storming, but there was no rain. I saw all sorts of color in the sky and lots of red flashes that I could only describe as looking like heat lightning, but these flashes were lighting up the entire sky. As I watched all the intense flashes of light, before I knew it, I blacked out completely. The next thing I remember is my wife waking me up the next morning in a frantic panic because she didn't know where I was. I tried explaining to her what I had witnessed, but she said I was just dreaming and was upset that I had wandered off last night. Accusing me of getting drunk and passing out, but it's important to note that I don't get drunk and I would never just wander off and never come back. Something I can't explain happened that night. Can someone let me know what I experienced? Could it have been a vivid dream if I passed out? Has anyone else experienced something similar? Either way, I know that I don't have the same affinity for oceans and vacations as I did before this occurrence. Hey friends, thanks for listening. Be sure to subscribe and click that notification bell to be alerted of all future narrations. If you got a story, be sure to submit them to my subreddit, r let's read official, and give and receive feedback from the community, and maybe even hear your story featured on the next video. And join my Discord to interact with me and other listeners directly. If you want to support me even more, grab early access to all future narrations for just $1 a month on Patreon, and maybe even pick up some Let's Read merch on Spreadshirt. All links in the bio. Thanks so much, friends. And remember, some people can't fold laundry because of this.